Hi everyone, this is Kenny Gibbons with Fifth Seal Ministries. First and foremost, I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. May we all be reminded of the second coming of Christ as we reflect on the first coming this season. The purpose of this video is to examine the characters and events surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. These moments are not without a deeper meaning. When you acquaint yourself with all the gospel accounts of Jesus, you begin to notice correlations between the ministry and the purpose of Jesus' first coming and the types and shadows found in his birth. I'm excited to share some of my observations with you, so let's dive right into the text. Luke chapter 2 verses 1-7 through seven states, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was a governor in Syria, and all the people were on their way to register for the census, each to his own city. Now Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Before we continue, I want to make a few observations. We all know that Jesus was born in a manger, but why? What was the purpose and intent of this? Simply put, this humble beginning represented the intent of his first coming as a lamb. This is further emphasized in John chapter 1 verse 29. John the Baptist presents Jesus to the people of Israel, stating, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does this mean? It meant that even from his birth, Christ was always intended to be the perfect sacrifice for the remission of sin. Through his death and resurrection, those of us who are saved by the Lord have been washed clean, forgiven, and have been made new in the Spirit. We inherited his righteousness that we might gain eternal life. I also want to point out that there was no room for Christ at the inn. There was no provision made for Christ as he entered this world. You would think that the promised Savior King would be born in a palace. You would expect that he should receive the best treatment, the finest clothes, the best education, and riches beyond imagining from his birth. You would expect the people of Israel to recognize the prophecy surrounding his birth and to act quickly and eagerly to welcome and accommodate him. Instead, he was met with dismissal. Jesus himself later says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. From the very beginning to the very end of his first coming, Christ would be found not living in a mighty fortress or palace, but rather he lived much like a wanderer and in exile. He would regularly travel from place to place to teach, and he would often retreat to the wilderness by himself to be alone with the Father. You get a sense that Christ could not settle down in this world because it was not his true home. His kingdom was not of this world, and he certainly conducted himself in that way. There were those who showed him love and compassion for sure. They were those who saw him for who he truly is, and they welcomed him with open arms. But as we know, Israel as a whole would come to reject Jesus as Messiah and would send him to be crucified. It grieves my heart as it did Christ when I read of these moments in the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 23 verses 37 to 38, Jesus voices his grief when he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who have been sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, 
your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Because of their rejection, Christ pronounces judgment on Israel. As a result of this, the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. And Paul remarks in Romans 11 that a partial hardness has been placed on the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, at which point the people of Israel will see Jesus as the Messiah and King he has always been. At this time, they will collectively repent and believe in him just prior to the millennial reign of Christ. Let's pick up where we left off in Luke chapter 2 verses 8 through 20 to examine more. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and laying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among people with whom he is pleased. When the angels had departed from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen him, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed about the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. We see in this passage that the angels announced the birth of the Messiah to the shepherds, not to the priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, or rulers over Israel, but to the meek and lowly shepherds who were tending their flock. What could be the reasoning behind this? Why would God choose to announce this most glorious news to these shepherds? As we know, God is intentional in all that he does. I believe that these shepherds represent the patriarchs and the heroes of the Old Testament who were given the promise of the coming Messiah. Why do I think this? Because many of them held the same profession. Some of the prominent shepherd figures in the Old Testament include Adam, as he cared for the animals in Eden, Abel, Job, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's sons, Moses, David, and you could even argue that Noah was a shepherd as he guided and cared for the animals on the ark. In fact, Jesus himself is called the Good Shepherd in relation to us, his sheep. Many of these founders of the faith made covenants directly with God. They were given promises that one day a Redeemer would come, and they looked forward to the promise of that coming Messiah. The faith that they had in this future Redeemer would be counted to them as righteousness. By this faith, they were able to walk with God. When Christ was born, the Redeemer had come. The promise was made manifest. And Christ was to be acknowledged first by those who represented the fathers of the faith. It's also important to note the order of those who met the newborn king. The shepherds also represented the remnant of Israel and were given the honor of welcoming him before anyone else. The idea of a remnant has been presented throughout both the Old and New Testaments. They are the Israelites who remained faithful to God, even though the majority had not. God has always preserved a people who are loyal to him, even during the most wicked times in biblical history.
Months later, the wise men arrive at the house of the Lord. They would come to represent the Gentile nations who gain access to this new covenant through Christ after it had been presented to the Jews. This would be a reflection to the godly order of Christ's ministry. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. How amazing is it that the Lord made a way for us Gentiles to have access to an everlasting union with him. Like Abraham, he called us out of this wicked pagan world and purchased us with his blood, that we might experience the riches of his goodness and mercy. I am so humbled that God always had a plan of redemption for those with the greatest need. May we be humbled forever, knowing that he gave salvation to us freely and rescued us from our inevitable destruction. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 to speak to some more events that take place afterwards. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for from you will come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Let's take a moment to analyze what just took place. Herod and all of Jerusalem were blind to the signs that pointed to the coming Messiah. They knew the prophecies, but could not see them play out before their very own eyes. It was only through the testimony of the wise men that they were ever clued into Christ's coming. After they were made aware, their reaction was not of rejoicing, but they were all troubled within their very soul. Why were they troubled? Because Jesus is quite the divisive character. He exposes the hearts of men. At his second coming, there will only be two reactions on that great and terrible day of the Lord, rejoicing and terror. Herod and his associates would be exposed for the truly wicked people that they were, and they would try to put a stop to it by any means necessary. We know that throughout Christ's ministry, he encounters opposition from both the rulers and the religious leaders of his day. Many times, Christ would expose them, and they would respond by plotting his death, just as Herod attempted to do. Let's see what happens next in the text. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi, and determined from them the exact time the star appeared, and sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go, and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I, too, may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star, which they had seen in the east, went on ahead of them, until it came to a stop over the place where the child was to be found. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after they came into the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And after being warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Matthew chapter 2 verses 7 through 12. When I look at the wise men, knowing that they represent the Gentile believers, my mind is taken to other events that have yet to take place. First, we must acknowledge that the wise men were the only ones who had insight into the signs of the coming Savior. The celestial sign that would herald the coming of the King. 
Can you think of another instance where celestial signs are used in the Bible? How about, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light? Interesting, isn't it? Both comings of Christ are preceded by something that only God can manipulate. Not only that, but in both instances, these signs are recognized by the Gentiles primarily. Since now we are living in the time of the fullness of the Gentiles, we have been instructed to look for the signs that point to the second coming of Christ. Those who are truly serving the Lord will recognize these signs, and after they are seen, the Lord comes, and we will be gathered to Him from the four corners of the earth. Fascinating, isn't it? You can see all kinds of types and shadows in the details of this account. We truly serve a Lord who has built a beautifully grand narrative. Oh, how wonderful it will be to see it all come together in the end. After these wise men meet the Lord, they worship Him and present their finest gifts to Him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. At this moment, I'm immediately reminded of Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they will worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. In an act of total submission and exaltation, these great men acknowledge the one who is greatest. They glorify the one who is worthy of their praise. They relinquish their high positions to bow before the one who would rule over all. The gifts they present are those suitable for a king, and they are not given through demand, but rather they are freely given in love and admiration. Let's take a look at the rest of the story in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 21. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. This happened so that what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent men and killed all the boys who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity who were two years old or under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then, what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted, because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and settled in a city called Nazareth. This happened so that what was spoken through the prophets could be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Through the providence of God, Jesus was protected from the wrath of Herod. However, many children lost their lives due to this wicked decree. In some sense, I believe this event points to the persecution of the church throughout history. The children were those who resembled Christ at that time. They fit the same description as a true Messiah and they were killed purely by association. The very term Christian means to be Christ-like, and Jesus was the first amongst many brethren. He provided an example for us to live by, and a means to live as he did. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 states, 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Every day the Holy Spirit works within us to make us more like Christ. He works to sanctify us to live in a way that reminds people of the testimony of Christ. When they see us, they should think of him. Even still, we know that the world is at enmity with the Lord. Because we resemble Christ, we will also be hated as he was. John chapter 15 verses 18 through 25 states, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. If they followed my word, they will follow yours also. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. The one who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me, and my father as well. But this has happened, so that the word that was written in their law will be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. If we call ourselves Christians, we are to expect opposition from the world. Just as they persecuted our Lord, they will also persecute us. When these things happen, we should count it all as joy. It is through these moments that we demonstrate the testimony of our Lord to the greatest degree. We may share in these sufferings now, but when he returns, he will glorify us just as he has been glorified. He leads, we follow. And to that, I say, Amen. In summary, I want to encourage you this Christmas season. As we reflect on the first advent of our Lord, we see God's intentionality in each and every occurrence. To those who are diligent in the study of his word, the Lord grants glimpses of insight into his master plan. Because of the testimony of the first coming, we have the assurance that his second coming is sure to happen as well at the appointed time. Here is what I want to charge you with. Like the wise men, be ever watchful for the signs preceding our Lord's arrival. And don't merely watch, but be prepared to present your life before his feet as an offering. Put up your rewards in heaven so you can present your gift to the Lord after he gathers you to himself. He is worthy of all the glory and praise we could possibly offer on that day. This will wrap up my personal observations from the birth of Christ. Let me know what you liked and comment below if there's something that I haven't considered. Also, feel free to like and subscribe for future study and encouragement. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lamb of God, we thank you for all that you have done to purchase us from this world. As we look at the events of your first coming, let us be reminded of the high price you paid in our place. We are not worthy of such a sacrifice, but we are so very thankful. We pray that you make each and every one of us into your image, that your name might be proclaimed throughout the earth until the day of your arrival. May that day come soon, so we may be gathered to worship and adore you in person. And so we may present our gifts to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in love and admiration. Keep our hearts ever trained on you and help us always to look for the signs of your coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. 
there will be no end to the increase of his government, or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness, from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Amen. Maranatha, brothers and sisters.